Hey, greetings, everyone. Uh, Joe Tebow here, joined uh, with my esteemed colleagues, uh, Jim Ostrich and Paul Jobin from uh, Federal Highway Administration's Office of Operations Traffic Incident Management Program. Here for the August Talking Tim. And I'll tell you, here we are, August 24th. Summer is slowly slipping away from us, circling the drain, as, as you would. Um, so with, uh, with, with, with the, the, the full agenda that we have today, I always want to take time to, to thank uh, uh, Kevin Vita, Adam Hops with the uh, NOCO. Uh, they, they work really hard for us, with us, uh, to bring a, a quality program. Uh, so I want to take time to uh, be sure to, to thank those folks. Uh, if you all have uh, questions as, as we roll along here, we, we will monitor uh, the, the chat pod. Uh, try to try to answer your questions, or we will have a question and answer session at the end of the event, um, you know, time permitting. Uh, so with that, um, let's take a look at today's agenda. And we want to start off with an update from Jim Ostrich. Uh, he's uh, going to give us an update on, on the training stats and uh, where we are with our traffic incident management training program and the advances that we've made there. Uh, we're also going to have an overview of the uh, Florida Heartland uh, TIM Committee and uh, Florida's expanded deployment right, of their cameras and road ranger vehicles. Uh, it, it's a great program. It's fascinating. Uh, so we'll, we'll hear from uh, Florida there. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, TIM capability maturity self-assessments and what's new for that. There's, there, there's been some adjustments there. So uh, uh, we'll, we'll give you an update on, on that. And... Um, then we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, the NUG, uh, the the National Unified Goal, uh, the, the rele relevancy uh, of the the NUG strategies, and um, as I said, time permitting, um, we'll get into uh, question and answer session. Taking a look ahead to September, and we're going to have a presentation from the from Houston Fire, uh, Captain Bear Wilson from Houston Fire Department will be with us to discuss their program. Uh, we'll also deal with the, uh, the, the results of the move over and responder technology projects, some interesting, very fascinating stuff there uh, that uh, Martha Moorcock, who's also joining us today, uh, will, uh, will take on for us. And then uh, the strategy review for the NUG, um, a kind of a continuation or where we, where we left off today, if you would. So with all that said, and uh, wanting to get right into it, I believe it's time to bring on Jim Ostrich to give us an update on our Tim training stats. Take it away, Jim, thanks. Thanks, Joe, and welcome again, everyone. Uh, as Joe said, summer's uh, going very fast here, about to end. Uh, and, uh, but I am very happy, I have to say, uh, just so close, right? That 600,000 total trained, uh, we are almost there. And, and thanks to all your efforts, uh, no question about it. And uh, uh, we'll keep marching on, as our boss used to say, the march to a million or more. Um, but here, here you have the stats. The bad news or the sad news is the fatalities, the responders being struck and killed by those D drivers that, you know, as we know through the training, if you've taken the training, the drug, the drowsy, the drunk, the distracted, the disabled, or just plain dangerous drivers out there, uh, which are, are constantly uh, taking away our, our wonderful responders and, and impacting the lives of, of those individuals, for sure, the families, the families, the children, the, the, the wives and husbands and aunts and uncles and grandparents. And uh, you can see the numbers here. Um, 
I spend time repeating this always because this is really one of the big reasons we do what we do with traffic incident management and uh, why we must never give up, never give in and, and keep pushing uh, traffic incident management good practices. The number of injuries, as we've said in the past, is an unknown. Uh, uh, could be a hundred, you know, thousands time, you know, thousands more than the fatalities. And as you know, many of them career ending type injuries. So please keep promoting the training. And uh, as we always say, Tim definitely saved lives and we're doing that together collectively. Next slide, Katie. So uh, here you have a breakdown by discipline. You can see, uh, well, you can see it for yourself. Uh, it's not rocket science, but we definitely, we definitely have a, a long ways to go. One of the strongest tools we have to prevent those fatalities and injuries uh, working together. The map here uh, of the uh, total uh, responders trained in person and those uh, on the web-based training, either through National Highway Institute, uh, which is a training arm for the Federal Highway Administration, or through our dear friends over at Responder Safety Learning Network, Emergency Responder Safety Institute, um, broken down by state. Next slide. This is the total. If, if it interests you, please take a look. And I'll say this, as we've always said, or like to say, whether you're on a committee or not, um, there, there are leaders and champions in every, all 50 states, DC and Puerto Rico, that make it their business to, to manage uh, training. Um, yes, there are, you know, slowdowns for sure. Obviously, we're still coming out of a pandemic, but in particular, the number of trainers that are active in your state. If you want to become a trainer, please contact uh, Joe, Paul, or myself, or uh, we can provide you the point of contacts list in, in your state to, to reach out to those individuals uh, that are leading uh, the TIM program. It's an important important piece of information for you to know. Um, so this is the national goal map. Uh, uh, you can see the 55% there uh, and the key to the lower right uh, where states stand, uh, putting the states in the light blue on the spot uh, for the numbers, you know, if. If your state's not moving, why aren't you moving? I asked this during last month's webinar because I consider all of you family. We consider you family and we need to just be honest. And, and so how can we help you? How can we help you further, you know, reach your goal of responders trained? And, and by the way, it's the number in parentheses for, that you see there under the percentage that's the number of responders, uh, the responder population within your state that, that you and your state, not necessarily you directly, but others back in 2014, 2015 established as the number that needed to be trained in your state. So uh, if you didn't know that, you know it now. And of course the progress that you've made to, to reach that number. Uh, and then pay attention down below in the lower left, the over 1 million, as we said earlier, uh, that we're trying to get to. It's been 10 years, ladies and gentlemen, 10 years. Uh, and uh, even though we know that we're in the rear somewhat, uh, where the statistics, the numbers trained are not being reported, unfortunately, Paul, Joe, and I, we always say that, and we know that to be true. We get calls every once in a while, email from somebody that says, hey, I graduated from a uh, Tim trained a trainer back in 2014 or 16 or 17 or whatever. And uh, th they wanna report the numbers. 
uh, all these years later. And we obviously welcome them and, and help them report those numbers. But it's a good question to ask your trainers too. Are you reporting the numbers? Are you reporting the numbers individually or through some single point of contact within your state? Because we do have states that established a person as the single point of contact that trainers would report their numbers to, who in turn that single point of contact would upload the data to our national uh, uh, TIM training database. Next slide. Here's the progress since the last report. You can see who's training and who is not. And the next slide shows the top 10. Tom, ten, top 10 states. Kudos to all of you again. And last but not least, our, uh, our contact info. Hey, Jim. Yeah, Paul. Could I interrupt for a second? Hi, everybody. It's Paul Joden here. Hey, um, I'd like to make a challenge to everybody that's out there, to our, our friends and um, and colleagues and partners throughout the country there. Um, let's get to 600 by the next reporting period. Jim, when's the, when's the next reporting period? Well, we two received, weeks, uh, yeah, approximately two weeks, depends on if we get all the data from NHI, Paul, but within the next two to three weeks. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm just, um, Putting down a challenge to everyone out there to, you know, we, you know, just need a few, few thousand more trained. So, as Jim was saying, if you know, let's let's either do some training or, or um, if you haven't sent in your recorded numbers, really would like to see the next reporting period go over that goal of six hundred. Uh, on one of our goals is six hundred, but let's reach that that peak. So, um, sort of sending out a challenge to everybody. Don't make me call you individually. I make us call you individually, but uh, anyways, Jim, I just wanted to throw down that challenge to our, our friends out there. I like it, Paul. I like it. Good, good challenge. So, okay. So we're back to you. Well, you stay with this, Paul. I can, I can. Um, okay. Let's let me, let me continue with that. Katie, so many of you know, we have next generation, Tim. There are many facets of, of next generation, Tim. Um, we have a, 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 a lot of resources. Um, we have just um, finished uh, finalizing uh, uploading some of those resources to the NOCO uh, TIM page. So you, you see the NOCO TIM page, you see the, um, the you know, the, the link. I mean, you all, you all know how to find NOCO, National Operations Center of Excellence, and then TIM. And then you see on the left there, the next gen TIM resources. And then you'll see our recently developed fact sheets. Um, and Katie, why don't we? Uh, so we have a fa the fact sheet on what is next gen Tim overall next gen Tim. So if you you know you you uh, Tim on local roads is another fact sheet. You know, so if you're trying to explain uh, these fact sheets are two pages front and back or one page front and back. Um, you know, that's an easy way to say. Here, um, uh, this is what Next Gen Tim is about. Uh, you know, if you want to talk about why Tim is important on local roads, there's another fact sheet. Uh, there's another fact sheet on the Tim training. It explains the training. It, it sp explains the benefits and the you know the, the learning objectives. Um, there's a, a, a separate one on Tim data. Um, uh, you know, again, what, what, what the TIM data elements are that we're collecting nationally and, you know, and what some recommended practices are. Um, uh, another one on, um, on UAS systems for TIM, you know, so uh, some, some facts, if you will, on UAS. Uh, again, these are supposed to be just short and sweet, elevator speech type, type information, high level um, video sharing for TIM. Uh, is another fact sheet, and um, and then uh, computer aided dispatch, integrated computer aided dispatch, uh, um, is another one, and then um, all responded to vehicle alerts. I can barely read that, so I hope the website's a little clearer than that. Um, 
And then there's there's actually one that we didn't put up here yet that but um, Katie and team, if we could just remember, is uh, what is Tim? So a general fact sheet. But we have that uh, at you know we can send that along. Jim Joe or I can send that along to you guys if if that's helpful. So you know we don't we're not saying you need each and every one of them. We're not saying you sh you know that, that each and every one of them is important, but they are a resource depending on your situation, depending on your meeting, depending on what you're trying to explain to people. For, for you to uh, for you to, to use and utilize, and they're right there on the, in the NOCO website. They're they're they'll be on the Federal Highway website as well, very shortly. So, um, and then we we are working on some case studies relative to the different components. And I just explained each one of those fact sheets is a is actually one of the components of Next Gen Tim. For those of you that don't know what that is, we provide resources for Next Gen uh, Next Generation for any of those activities there and more. And then, um, but the case studies uh, are soon, uh, uh, there's, there's two of them in progress now. Well, there's five of them in progress now. We'll, we'll be able to share those uh, on the same website. So check it out and, uh, and, and please use so that um, we can keep keep uh, expanding uh, our, our knowledge base. So with that, Joe, back to you, I guess. Okay, Paul. Hey, thanks, Paul. Thanks, Jim. Uh, you, you know, traffic incident management saves lives every day. Firm believer. I've used it, seen it work. You know, it's a, uh, it, it's, it's like a, a single, single, single strand of silk from a spider web is, is strong in itself, but it's not very useful to the spider at first, right? And I see our, our TIM program, many have referred to it as the tentacles of an octopus, but I see it more like the spider web, if you would. And that is when we bring all these elements together and build that web, you know, it's strong, it's versatile, uh, and it holds up under all kinds of conditions. So when, when we see all the different resources, like uh, Paul was just talking about with the NOCO site, with all the resources there, and with the uh, Federal Highways resource site and uh, NHI, you know, there's a tremendous amount of information out there and a, tre a tremendous amount of, of things going on in, in many different areas and fields. So we, what we try to do is, is bring you a little bit of that, um, each talking Tim, uh, and uh, let folks share what they're doing and uh, their, their webs, if you would, right? Um, and and how, they're, how they're tackling uh, this issue. So with that said, uh, I'd like to bring on uh, Tom Arsenal. Um, from uh, from Florida, All right? He's going to give us an overdue a overview of the, uh, the Heartlands uh, Tim Committee and uh, their expanded uh, use of cameras on uh, Rome Ranger vehicles. So, uh, with all that said, Tom, thanks for coming. I appreciate it. You're muted, and you're on. And thank you. Appreciate that. And uh, welcome everybody to uh, Florida District One. We're going to talk about uh, two topics today, the Heartland Tim team and the RMC or the Ranger mobile cameras. So appreciate that and the introduction. So a little bit about me real quick. Um, I've been in law enforcement for about 35 years. I was in the Detroit area just south of the city in a little place called Brownstown. And I was a, a traffic officer there for 15 years, then a shift commander for 15 years. And then I came down to Florida and was a, a patrolman in Florida Gulf Coast University Police Department right down here in Fort Myers. And then I joined the TIM program as a law enforcement liaison through FDOT. And now I am the uh, TIM program manager of District 1 via Metric Engineering to FDOT. So in April of this year, District 1 held the inaugural Heartland Counties. Tim team meeting. This included training and instant debriefs. So this is a really good map here. You can see the heartland of Florida. Hence the hey, heartland. Hey Tom, hey Tom, we're not seeing your shared screen. Oh, sorry. There you go. There you go. There we go. All right. Well, I'm going to go back to my pictures because they're pretty. That's how people <laughs> know who I am. <laughs> sorry about that, guys. Thanks for pointing that out. So this was. Uh, what I talked about earlier. And in the, the Heartland team team is uh, right there in the center of the state. There are six counties and there are no interstates that run through this uh, district. 
but it's all part of the District 1 TIM team. On the further east coast is the uh, West Palm Beach and that Fort Lauderdale, Miami. Our area is Fort Myers and Tampa. We go from Tampa all the way down to the Broward County line, which includes Alligator Alley, and that's all of I-75. These six counties here, they have no interstate running through them, but although they do have a lot of state roads and US highways. So what Paul just talked about is a great example of what we're doing in this Heartland TIM team. It's the next gen TIM. We expand our uh, geographic coverage with our uh, TMC, the information timelines for incident detection, particularly on local roads and the state highways. It focuses on uh, local agency TIM programs, which we just introduced in April, while integrating new and emerging technology tools and training to improve incident detection and reduce safety response and clearance time for on all the roadways. So this is uh, the next gen picture. We've all seen this before. The incident occurs, we utilize the TMC and we can forward information to our incident re responders and even the motoring public to try to avoid these situations or these locations where there's a, a crash. And this is done through our arterial management, and that includes signal timing adjustments, uh, providing traveler information, especially during special events or construction on state roadways, utilizing uh, DMS, Florida 511, those type of apps, the Waze app, et cetera. Arterial management also coordinates traffic information with counties, cities, TMCs, and other local agencies within the district. This is a great program. Uh, we really try to utilize these three entities and vendors to get the information out there. We all know that as soon as there's something happening and somebody's using their Google map or their Waze app, they immediately wanna be notified to find a quicker and safer route. So we try to stress that with our motoring public. At, at the Heartland Tim team, we, uh, our focus was to be improving the three Cs that being communication, coordination, and cooperation. Among all incident responders, those listed on the uh, right side of your screen, the benefits include reducing incident-related congestion, improving response and clearance times, preventing secondary crashes, improving traffic flow, and most importantly, that's why we're all here, is improving first responder safety. And we can see the list of all those that are participants in the Heartland TIM team. It was our very first meeting was very successful. We had a lot of different vendors there. We had a lot of FDOT staff. Uh, we have a Heartland FDOT uh, transportation system, which is uh, real exciting about having the new Heartland TIM team come out their way. We always include one training episode of all the TIM meetings we do. And the very first one that we did at the Heartland TIM team included uh, electric vehicle fires. And that was put on by our RTMC, STMC operations manager, Luis Hernandez. We all know that dealing with electric vehicle fires is uh, something completely different and that it needs to be addressed to our first responders that may not know about these EV fires. You know, your typical, Regular car fire takes about three to 4,000 gallons of water, whereas uh, electric vehicle fires take anywhere between 30 to 40,000 gallons of fire. So we put that on a very good presentation for our team out that way. And it was very well received because a lot of uh, other firemen that attended had not known about these EV fires. And Florida is a, one of the emerging states and leaders in electric vehicles. We also do what's called incident reviews and with the partnering with FHP and other local agencies, we do crash reviews. We try to do at least one in every one of the, our counties that is in the heartland. So this is a, a quick example of a, a incident debrief, we call this. This was a case on January 17th on State Road 700 and US 98. See the location there. This is in Okeechobee County. 
And this was a, a head-on crash and we had vendors and responders that are participants and we give them a heads up. We send the crash report to FHP and we try to have one of the officers that was either on scene or the traffic homicide investigator that handled the case. And uh, with each case, we do a timeline review because we all know um, we want to try to get the road open as quickly and safely as possible. And in Florida, we have a real unique situation called the open roads policy. Open roads policy is supported by FDOT and FHP. It's a joint operation where we try to get all roads open as quickly as possible. So here's an example of uh, the timeline of, of the crash that we would have reviewed and the total duration with a fatality investigation was just a little bit over 200 minutes. And if you've ever investigated a fatality crash, you know that's actually a pretty good timeline. So we're real proud of that kind of stuff. This slide here, you can see we had uh, participants from all over the uh, vendors and all over the state in this Heartland Tim team and very, uh, very, very well respected people on this list here. We had a lot of members from FDOT that were excited to be a part of the new TIM program. Uh, they've heard of TIM, but they've never actually participated in a TIM program because there was none out that way. So they were very uh, excited to have a program come out that, that way. And you can see there's local PDs, county sheriffs, uh, county fire departments, whole whole bunch of people from all over the state, right there in the center of the state that participated in that. And at the conclusion of every meeting, we always do a uh, review of all the, the participants. We do a round table. We have the record operators there, of course, the FHP, the Heartland Regional TPO. They were real excited about having the uh, Tim team come out that way it's a training program for everybody and they're they're learning and one of the things that we do in our future tim teams out that way is we normally pick a chapter from the sharp two training and push that out to the uh, team out that way because we do offer a sharp two class that you spoke of earlier and we're going to offer a class in september we have 30 seats and that filled up in about five days so we are doing our part down here in florida to raise your numbers that you spoke of earlier. And I appreciate you pushing that out to the, to the team as well. So changing gears, we're gonna talk uh, briefly about our District 1 Ranger mobile camera, or we call it the RMC. This is a camera that was mounted on our Road Ranger vehicles and is uh, live action at the scene uh, camera. So, uh, Earlier this year, the district and the TSMO staff had the vision to bring live high definition video streams right to the TMC. Our goal was to deploy the cameras mounted right on top of the Road Ranger vehicles. So this is a view of on the left hand side, this is the view that we, we would normally see utilizing the pole camera. The pole camera is, is about every quarter mile here in Florida, some are closer, some are further. But this would have been the normal view. On the right-hand side of your screen, you now see the live view. So this was a live view of an action that was taken and it shows the sun guide operators and anybody that has sun guide accessibilities can pull this camera up and view exactly what's going on live on a scene. So this was led by uh, Justin Merritt and Transcore's David Burnside and the Road Ranger staff. We worked through a bunch of trials and tribulations to get this pretty successful. Again, it's called the RMC. So this is a back view and we can turn these cameras. Anybody that has, like I said, capabilities of the sun guide can access these cameras. And what's great about these cameras are the road ranger can pull up and we, so you know how sometimes you can't see into the woods because you don't have the right camera angle or if you have a bridge blocking your view. We can have the road ranger park at a certain location and we can see that car that's gone into the woods at a, at a long thing di distance from the interstate live. So because this was a pilot program, we utilized whatever equipment we had in our garage 
And these are your typical candy cane cameras that we mount on the poles on the interstate. So it was a, um, not the best looking system out there, but we did a six month pilot program and it was very, very well received. Everybody liked it. So we then decided to upgrade utilizing these first net modems. These are very durable and rugged. They're called infinities and they communicate securely, which was a huge issue. We had to go through security to get a secure feed to the RTMCs. The camera can be turned 360 degrees or PTZ, go up and down. It's activated when the road ranger raises his arrow board. So the video is not always constantly leaving, you know, going live. When the arrow board is down, the camera is off. And those with access to Sun Guide then can click on the camera. And this camera is called the RMC 111 and view the action live. So here we have a crash right in front of the Road Ranger camera that we were able to move and see the responders come and go and get a good timeline. This is our new installment of it. This is what the new camera looks like. And we are going to uh, dispatch these on all 35 of our trucks that we have here in District 1. And this is our very first one of the Infinity cameras that we installed over the weekend. Very excited about this program. And like I said, it's been awesome. This is the modem that sits in the truck. You can see it's a very weatherproof box. And then everything is connected through the FirstNet program right to our sun guide and to our operators. This is how we locate the camera. Right now, the camera is stationary at our garage. It can be easily listed as a, we go further and start adding more cameras. All an operator has to do is scroll down to RMC 111, right click it, it says find on map, and it takes you right to this location. They double clip that red camera right there and they get the live feed. And they can put that on a video screen about the size of a theater at our TMC down here in uh, Port Myers, and even in, in our friends there in uh, Bradenton, uh, STMC up there. Then our friends at FHP also can see this and, and watch on their troopers and determine if we want to activate a risk or not. It's been very well received. This is another live view that we had. This was uh, looking forward at over the uh, hood of the truck. And again, you can see a live action and it activates right as soon as he uh, puts his arrow board up. We had a good response. This is a good quote. TMC operators and FHP dispatched 360 degrees on scene coverage of an event, enabling them to provide accurate support to assist the road rangers and the traveling public. That's from our ITS manager, Ravi Brown. And from the road rangers uh, dispatch center, we have uh, FHP supervisor, Elise stated, the road ranger mounted cameras allow for a more in-depth on scene view of closures and scene safety. So this is a cool picture here. Uh, this is a helicopter and right above that helicopter, you see the pole. Well, that would have been the pole that would have been utilized to view this crash site. And you can see above is an overpass. So the overpass was blocking the view of the crash. So utilizing the RMC, we were able to do a 360 degree view of crash site and we could see the uh, helicopter coming and going. We could tilt the camera up to get the view of the helicopter. We could see the injured parties and how many there were. So it was a great, this was a really, really good scene here to utilize the RMC and, and show its capabilities. And I know there's gonna be questions at the end or I'll check the chat box if you have anything now. There's my contact information and I appreciate your time. Hey, thanks, Tom. Greatly appreciate it. Good presentation. Uh, cameras, you know, they're outstanding resource. Uh, I remember when it used to be said that a picture is worth 100 words and video is worth a million. I tell you, uh, back at the TMC, the decisions that can be made, uh, the arrangements and resources that can be 
taken care of just by watching what's going on at the scene. Yeah, what a great resource. You guys did a great job. And uh, looks like you went about it in the right way too, right? Low cost, use what you had, and yeah. uh, and then made your point, and there it, it flew flew on its own merit. So, thanks, sir. Greatly appreciate that. Thank you. And there are some questions in the chat there uh, too. If you get a second, uh, one of the questions uh, just popped up. So if you get a okay, get yeah. A um, do you want me to do those now? Well, if you could, yeah. Yeah, Perfect. sure. It says how frequently are road rangers on scene, for instance. Well, right now we, we dispatch about 11 road rangers covering uh, 189 miles. Everything from the Alligator Alley, like I said, that's our only 24-7 operation. And they, they respond to everything from debris calls to crash sites to rollovers and uh, medical emergencies out on the interstate. Right now they are interstate only, I-75 from Tampa to Broward County line. They will go on the arterials if the on and off ramps are affected. So they, they are very busy, uh, 30 to 40,000 calls a, a month. And right now we're at over a million. So very busy. Yeah, outstanding. Thanks, the sir. EV presentation, yeah, we did a really good EV presentation. We do have that available. I could give it to the team. And uh, that was a really good uh, presentation, very well received. And that's all I see. Outstanding. Thanks, sir. Thank you. So at this time, I like to switch gears a little bit. Uh, I want to bring up my uh, esteemed colleague, Paul Joden, and uh, he's going to be joined by Martha Moorcock, uh, uh, who's a program manager, one of our consultant support folks, uh, out outstanding knowledge and background there. I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, 2022 Tim Capability Maturity Self-Assessment and some of the, uh, some of the uh, late breaking changes, if you would. So, uh, Paul, I see you popped up. You're ready. I am ready, and um, who's who's going to have that PowerPoint? I just want, might want to put that up uh, while I am chatting here. Yeah, so, hey, Tom, um, as, I'm sorry, Paul. Tom, can you um, can you uh, unshare your screen? Thanks, sir. There you go. All right, so math is there. Okay, so um, as as most of our, many of you, if not most of not if not all of you, know that um, every year we do a, this annual Tim self assessment. Um, you know where we ask regions of the country, um, mostly the Tim committees, to assess their program. So it um, it provides a. Uh, an overall picture of a holistic Tim program. So what, you know, what, you know, the, the, there's, um, I think there's 44 questions now and there's four different levels and you can, you know, you can, you know, in cooperation with your partners decide where you're at and then pick one or two things to, to um, improve upon for the next year that the Tim committee can work on. So in, in, um, in, Recent years, apparently, there's been a misunderstanding that it's it's a requirement um, for for certain metro areas for the top seventy five metro areas. Um, it's never been a requirement. It's been a recommended practice. Uh, there's been some concern within the federal highway um, just division offices uh, about their uh, workload and ability to coordinate the Tim self assessments and. Um, but it's uh, it's we it's it, so there's been a word put out that um, I am to make it perfectly clear that it's voluntary, especially for those federal, uh, especially for those division offices to to facilitate. But it is a highly recommended best practice to conduct the annual Tim self assessment. Um, it's um, and and we want to make sure that people understand that if you have a TIM committee, it's a it's a, a very good way to run through the strong components of a TIM program and pick an action item or two from the self-assessment. You get a score afterwards, we'll send you a score and the others will explain it a little bit 
further. So this year, um, after uh, 19 years with the same contractor, <laughs> there's a new contractor in place. Um, nothing against the former contractors who were awesome. They were absolutely uh, fantastic. A lot of you know, know who they are, um, but they were absolutely fantastic. And, um, and, and, and have done a great job over the past 19 years. Uh, just the way things worked out um, with, the, with the new contract, we were able to uh, put a new team in place, which has a, its own benefits, right? There's new perspectives and new, uh, and sort of a new, maybe some new um, um, ways of doing things. And, um, uh, and we've always, always been in a, um, in a position to do the, you know, to, to try to um, ease the burden on who's ever, who's ever uh, leading that exercise with, with the Tim, the Tim self-assessment. So uh, it, it's an opportunity to keep your, your um, program moving forward. Um, and, um, and it's a, it's a great exercise for, like I say, for that Tim, Tim committee to, to go through so that some of your partners understand the various aspects of a, of a TIM program that they may not realize. They might think a TIM program, we've heard it in the past, TIM program is uh, always service patrols or TIM program is training. And it's much more than that. We all know that, right? So, um, and that, you know, so, um, and it also, you know, it also gives you a baseline or, or a feel for where, where you are um, at compared to the rest of the nation as a, as a region. So, um, with that, Martha, what, what do we have for our next slide? Is that me? Oh, I just wanted to, I did want to say, um, yeah, so today we have um, Martha Eddy, who is, um, who is the project manager for this, for Battelle. And then um, an old friend has, uh, uh, Brian Purvis has been a friend of ours for a long time here at um, Jim and I, um, long before we were in our current positions, is sort of like the technical lead. And then Greg uh, Bog. I'm going to butcher your name, Greg. I'm sorry. Well, Greg is is um, is is sort of like the technical software guy that's that's going to help us with the tool. And you'll hear from all of them in a minute. And I need to stop talking. But you see the um, you see the agenda here that we're going to be talking about today. So, Martha, I'll hand it off to you. And um, Yep. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Um, my part is very short and sweet. It's just going over the agenda. So um, as, as Paul mentioned, this is a voluntary um, tool, but at the same time, it's really important for you guys to um, help us by filling it out um, and so that we can figure out areas that we need to um, maybe focus on a little bit more. So um, as, as Paul mentioned, um, from AECOM, we've got Brian Purvis. Um, he also works for Georgia DOT, and he's going to be um, taking it from here. And then I'm going to turn it to Greg Baumgartner, who is also with Battelle. Um, and Greg is um, the person who's been working or, or leading it, the development of this new online tool. He's going to walk us through a few things. We're going to give you guys some dates, really, really important dates for um, when we're going to be doing the training, which is September 7th, and when we're going to go live. It's go live is September 8th. Historically, I believe it's been September 1, but we're going to be going live on the 8th, and we're going to have the training on the 7th. Um, and we're going to walk through a few things like user input. Um, how do you get pre-registered if you need to get pre-registered for um, filling out your forms and getting getting into the online tool and everything? We'll, we'll have lots of valuable information and we'll make sure that these slides are presented at the end of, end of the day um, uh, to the NOCO site, um, I believe, is where they're going to be um, published. So with that, I'm going to stop my video. I'm turning it over to Brian and Brian, um, go to the next slide. Thanks. Yeah, appreciate it. Thanks, Martha. Um, so yeah, just big picture, you know, I know they said it's not mandatory, but it is a incredible tool. Um, you know, what gets measured gets done. So as we look at this, last year was a, a banner year for this program for the self assessments, we had 93 locations that reported in uh, 2021. Uh, the overall average score was, was really good. Um, it was 72.4%. So if you're grading yourself, you know, we're, we're right there in the, the high C, low B range um, as a nation. A lot of programs have been going for a long time. Uh, some of them are just coming on. So there's currently uh, two different versions of this um, self-assessment that are out there. 
There's one for the top 75 metro areas. And then there's a separate one for the rural and emerging team. So we're going to be doing some training on how to identify which one you want to do. Um, you know, big picture, there's 41 questions on the, the, the metro one, 32 on the non-metro. If, if you don't have a safety service patrol, uh, if you're not doing a lot with um, data and, uh, you know, things like that, then performance measures and stuff like that, then you probably want to do the rural and emerging one. But uh, next slide. But, you know, 93 is a lofty number. We would like to see that go up. Um, I manage a rural program in Georgia. I manage the GDOT CHAMP program. And these kind of reports really help us stay on target. So the purpose of this self-assessment tool is, you know, it's something that's easy to uh, put together. Um, we would hope that you would get a, a full TIM team, you know, do this in one of your regional meetings. And you'll have a couple months to do this. So if you go ahead and start thinking about it now, that's that's why we're talking about it today. Uh, it is an online tool. If you absolutely have to do it manually, there'll be a, a backup to do that. But really, the automated process and the online tool that we're developing will be the, the way to go. Um, it's basically you just run through the, uh, the 41 or the 32 questions, read it. Uh, there'll be a couple of uh, responses that you can pick from. You pick the appropriate response, and then they'll be a, you'll be able to actually put some free text under it. And what we're looking for is is really big picture. You know, do you have some some best practices you've implemented that have made those those uh, programs move forward, or are you interested in something moving forward? So it it allows you to put in some responses. Uh, a big component of that, and we've all been in this COVID environment. Um, it saves your data automatically as you're as you're going through these questionnaires. Uh, it will save it if you do get knocked offline. If something happens, uh, you know we know these are responders putting these these assessments together. So if you do have to come back, obviously that's not an issue. Um, also, another change is we're going to keep this uh, tool up year round. Uh, so if you do miss the cutoff. In November, you can still come in and, and do it at a later date. It is still a great tool uh, for you to use just to see where you're at in your program and to make sure that you're you're bringing in new ideas and continuing to move the ball forward. Uh, next slide. So as Martha said, we are going to have this up and live September 8th with the training on the 7th. Um, once you do submit online, uh, you will get a, a confirmation email to let you know that we did receive it. And then about three weeks after that, uh, that'll give me time to kind of look through the, the responses um, and give you some feedback on it. It will be tailored to your individual uh, inputs. Um, and then at the end of the year, so we'll finish these up in November. Uh, the end of the year, we'll go back and do a summary of results, uh, provide that back to uh, FHWA. You know, Jim and Paul and Tim will come, come back and, you know, put together uh, some slides and, and give you big picture analysis of what's going on and, and maybe probably one of these types of scenarios. Uh, next slide. So this is kind of our timeline. Uh, we're finishing up the development of the online tool right now, um, getting to the final stages of that. September 7th, go ahead and uh, save that date, especially in the afternoon. Uh, we're sending out, if you've done this um, self-assessment, if you did it last year, uh, we've already got your names and email addresses, and we will be sending out a notice to you to do it again, uh, recommending sending this to the state leads. Um, if you know, and I showed you the map earlier of the 93 that did it last year, if you know of regions that did not um, fill this out, especially if you've got rural areas, if you've got a new TMC that's come online, go ahead and start filling this out and um, assessing your program and and get on the list, and, and we'll you know, we'll push that through the state leads and uh, let them distribute that out. Um, September 8th, this, this tool will be live. That is the, uh, the link that you can use and you can pull that off the NOCO site this afternoon. Do like I did this morning, click it, and it will not be live. It will be live on September 8th. And then in uh, November, we'll have, uh, you know, from September through November, we'll get all the assessments together and uh, get the responses back out and then get the uh, the end of the year, we'll get you the uh, the bigger assessment of the entire nation and kind of give you uh, an idea of where everything stands. So with, with that, I'm gonna push it forward to Greg and let him talk about more of the technical side of it. Thanks everybody.
Thanks, Brian. This is Greg Baumgartner from Battelle. Uh, just, I'm going to speak briefly about the online tool that, as uh, Brian mentioned, that link is going to bring you to this new online tool. As you can see right uh, from that link, you know, it's, it's actually a cloud-based web application. Uh, so the question, first question we want to answer is why do we want to do this as, uh, as an online web-based application? Well, it, it's really, it, uh, designed to be a little simpler process for both you, the responders, uh, and for uh, the facilitators, and of course for um, the FHWA folks like Paul uh, to you know to lighten the workload for everybody. Because what, what we really want are the results, obviously, of this of this tool and the responses, and not so much have to have a, a big process to interfere with all that. So it, you know it is designed to be very seamless and automatic. Um, where you don't need to do manual entry. And then furthermore, um, building web applications with, with, you know, real data stores in the background will allow us to do a little more flexibility with reporting things and real-time based analysis and uh, other features that we will, you know, integrate uh, over time as, we, as time permits to, to make things e even easier and more responsive and, you know, to get the feedback that, uh, you need uh, quicker and you know more readily available. Next slide, please. So we're we're going to look at a, an example. We did we have the live system uh, in the cloud, but it's it's still going through testing. So what we did instead was we put these little gifs together uh, to show kind of what it's going to look like. So the first thing you're going to ask when you start the survey is um, that what who has been involved in, in this self assessment. So it looks, uh, uh, and you'll see a lot of these look exactly like the form from previous years. That, that is intentional, um, that you can go ahead and click who's, who's being involved. And um, then it's, what's going to happen is when you fill this information out and click next, it's going to get written to the database. So we, that, that facilitates what um, Brian was talking about before. If you, if you said, oh, shoot, I forgot to add somebody. Well, if you do it, you know, live in the survey, you can go back, obviously, with, um, screens and, and fill it in. Or later date, you say, well, I didn't know so-and-so from uh, the towing industry was there. So I could go back and, and add them and make sure that that gets counted, too, because that's in, all this is, is important information for the results of the survey. So um, next slide, please. So once you put in your stakeholder groups, you're going to get a list of sections. And you can see the top bar there shows like a progress. So this is broken up into a number of pages. And again, these questions are going to look a lot like the survey uh, that you've seen in the uh, previous years. The difference is, uh, the main difference is, we, you'll notice that we, we're not forcing um, the respondents to understand the, the scoring system. Not that it's complicated. It's just, I, I, I view it more as a distraction. What we really want is that, you know, to fill in these answers based on what you, where your program uh, fits as an answer to this question. So you're given four different examples. And, you know, if, if there's any criticism, you know, it might be that these are verbose and we might have to shrink them uh, a little bit to some more terse examples. But, the, you know, the idea is th these came right from the, um, the um, previous year's uh, survey instructions. So you can look through those. You can click on uh, which one best fits your program for each of these questions. The, the red indicates that your um, survey is incomplete, right? You haven't answered that question. Uh, and then uh, the green indicates that you have. You'll also notice um, that, and I, I'm trying to remember if this is in this video, but there, there are now free form text fields at the end. So um, when you go through and answer these questions, there may be reasoning behind your, your answer, or you may be unclear about something and you want to just give some feedback to, to the program leads um, about why you answered that question or give supplementary information about what, the, what important things related to that question. So those, form, those text fields will be available for you just to type something in. They don't get scored. They're just informational, uh, you know, to, to push it two-way communication, right? Push back towards um, the program leads for that, uh, for, for why you answered that question. 
And then of course, you're gonna click next to go from page to page to page. Next slide. Once you're done with the survey, as you see all the green lights were, were lit, lit up, everything was answered, then you'll get a thank you screen. The other thing you're gonna, that will initiate is an email uh, being sent to your, the email that you registered in um, that will give you a summary results. Uh, as Brian said, that'll, be, that'll come like almost immediately. Um, and then when you, um, but then he will also get a copy of the results and, and go through them and give personalized feedback, which will take a, a little longer in the neighborhood of three weeks or so to get those back. Um, but with the email that you'll get back will include like a preliminary final score um, where you'll see, you know, where, you, where your program falls. Um, you know, the other the other benefit to not adding the scoring here is, you know, you're not you're not necessarily um, biased by, you know, scores from where you think, you know, the number lies or whatnot, but you're, you're you know, it will should give a, a much more realistic version of of what the score will, will look like. And every one of these results, including all the scoring um, is going to be in the database. Um, and so one of the things that we will add it at some point once the survey goes live and live and we get data is some, you know, some quick summary results of, you know, those program, um, those different Tim committee uh, areas. Uh, it's the, like the map was showing earlier that Brian had, had shared to, to give some sort of feedback to say where we are, you know, as the, as the whole, as the whole nation goes. Next slide. The registration process is pretty simple. There will be a link there if you want to register. The the one thing we we decided to do, which would help, is to take the users from the 2021 survey, everybody that was that had submitted a worksheet, uh, and we're just going to pre-register you, and you'll get an email that allows you to set up the password and, and everything, so you don't have to go through this process. But there are others that may not have done this before, or um, or, or you know, didn't you know have, have to go through it for the first time? So they they will go ahead and click on the registration link. The registration does require us to approve it, um, which is just a limitation in the tool. But you know, you go ahead and put your name in your email. We say okay, you're ready to go, and then you'll have immediate access to the survey. And your your data, um, like your. Uh, organization information and your addresses can be updated by yourself uh, when you when you go in for the first time. Next slide. There's other functionality that are, is going to be available in, in this tool that just happens to be there because the, of the the actual nature of the web tool that we're we're used utilizing here. So things like messages and documents um, are important because we can pass them you know, some data back and forth. But also um, the key one here is gonna be user guide and instructions. So you guys won't be flying blind on uh, this particular survey. You know, you'll, you'll be able to reference the user guide online so you can see it as you go through the, the survey results. Uh, there will probably also be a link to the training if, if, we, if we see fit and get it recorded and, and it all looks good. Uh, that you might be able to, to reference directly from this website as well, and some general announcements uh, that we can take advantage of. Next slide. Um, we have a, the training again set for September 7th. Um, that's obviously approaching fast. So we will, we will have that webinar uh, link up as soon as humanly possible. And um, part of that will be providing the findings from the national survey itself, results from the past three years, at least, and then um, some more focused again on what this tool looks like in the process that you have to go through to, to do that, to fill it out. Next slide. Here are our contact information. You can reach any of us through email or if you have direct questions for today, I can try to answer them in the chat window. Thank you. Hey, Greg, there was one question that I saw that came in that um, who's gonna be approving the um, registration? That will be, uh, but Mattel has access to do that. Uh, myself uh, and colleagues, Martha probably can do it. 
and then I have uh, another developer that can help as well. So at least one of the three of us would be able to do that. There's no um, like qualifications that are required. It's just put your name in, put your email address in and your organization. And it's, it's not like you have to meet certain criteria. Exactly. And in fact, it would have been better if it just accepted it automatically. It's just a limitation in the tool. So, so it's really a rubber stamp, if you will. Okay. Um, I didn't see any other questions. Um, Want to hand it back to Paul, I think, or do we hand it back to Joe? I'll just follow up real quick. Um, one, one other feature we're going to have this year is, you know, the, the re final report used to be 50 pages, and I used to fall asleep reading it. Um, and I'm pretty sure that I, that I might have been just about the only one reading it. Uh, the, the next uh, step we went to over the last four or five years, we went to a 15, sort of like an executive summary. We're, we're striving this year to make their final report even shorter and, and, um, and user friendly. So that's a feature that we're going to try to uh, ac accomplish this year. And um, yeah, and then, and then that's it. And then, um, uh, you know, we're going to um, you know, see how it goes and just encouraging you all to participate. That's it. So with that, I guess back to Joe, which I guess will be back to Jim and I. So. Okay, Paul. Thanks, Thanks yeah. I mean, that's, that's important stuff, right, it, it, to, to make it, uh, I don't know, more user-friendly, uh, ease of use, uh, you know, ease of uh, uh, the end user to read it and comprehend what's in it. But, you know, we can't shortcut the, the incredibly important data uh, that's, that's captured inside of it. So uh, it's all good stuff. So I, I hope, it, uh, hope it eases uh, any, any burdens that may be out there. So next, we're going to shift gears a little bit more. Uh, we're going to talk about the, or the relevancy, uh, the uh, National Unified Goal, the NUG, or as, as I like to refer to it, is our, should, we, should we nudge the NUG? Uh, and in and, and doing that, uh, I'll bring back uh, Paul and uh, Jim Ostrich, uh, bring us up to speed on that. So take it away, guys. Yeah, like... Um... I think we were going to have Katie uh, now that I I called it. We, yeah, Katie did her hair today, so we would, we thought that we would um, <laughs> let her show herself on camera. She's better looking than Paul and Jim, and um, and she's going to walk us through this. What what the results were from the last talking Tim, and where what we want to do, uh, input moving forward. Right. So Katie, take it away. Thank you. So. Um... Yeah, like Paul said, what we wanted to just touch on is what we started last time, which is we uh, kind of gave a little bit of a background, talked about the National Unified Goal or NUG for Tim, um, and just kind of highlighted that in the next couple months, we want to really revisit this and update um, and kind of bring it current. So um, for those of you that are not familiar, this is the original NUG. Um, it was developed back in 2005, 2006, um, and it was pretty simple. It's responder safety, safe quick clearance, and then prompt reliable interoperable communications. Um, and so last time we asked for everybody's opinion, just really focusing on these three objectives. So uh, with the first one, uh, responder safety, um, we had three options. One was to no change. Um, a second option was to update it to be responder and motorist safety. Um, and then the, the third one, which you guys can see was obviously the highest selected, uh, was to update it to be the safety of responders and all road users. Um, and you can see our, our idea was that road route users really captures everybody. It's uh, motorists, it's pedestrians, it's bicyclists, um, and it's just more comprehensive. So um, that was kind of the clear winner, so to speak. Um, so we went with that. And then in terms of safe, quick clearance, um, we actually like this one. Uh, it's pretty simple to the point. Um, but so we just kind of put a word cloud out there and let people add things that they thought uh, might be added or beneficial to add in. Um, but you can kind of see if you look at what the results are, um, safe quick clearance was in there, the word safe right in the middle, quick and clearance. Um, so with this really and the feedback we got, we felt like safe quick clearance was probably the best thing to stick with. 
Um, the last one that had the most significant change is that prompt reliable interoperable communications. Um, so we had four options here. Uh, the first one was to just keep it as is. Um, the second one was to just remove this objective completely from the NUG. And you can see we didn't get a lot of movement on that. Um, and then we had two alternatives um, that got quite a few votes. One was communication, coordination, cooperation, and commitment. Um, and then just slightly wordsmithed was the one that had the highest votes. Um, and that was a commitment to communication, coordination, and cooperation, or the three Cs, um, which Tom mentioned earlier. Ultimately, um, what we came up with is this pro proposed revision to the NUG. Um, and, and really the difference here is we, we, when we talked about it, we said, well, really, we don't want just a commitment to communication, coordination, and cooperation. Um, we also want a commitment to safe and quick clearance, and we want a commitment to that uh, safety of responders. So um, we pulled that word up. So, um, and, and kind of had it apply to all three of the objectives. So you can see here, um, our proposed revision is the TIM NUG is a commitment to the safety of responders and all road users, safe, quick clearance, and then communication, coordination, and cooperation. So similar to what we did last time, um, we would like to get your guys' input on this. So we have set up a Mentimeter. Um, so I'll go ahead and also type, or if someone could type that in the chat, um, we, like I said, we'd love to get your input um, on this, this revised version of the NUG. So give people just a minute to get up onto the Mentimeter. And then I'll kind of bring this over. We'll give people a second. So it's in the chat pod too. Um, and then here you go. Um, I, we can actually see some live voting as we go along here. So um, and I know we have about 120 people on. So I think uh, Paul and Jim are gonna make me keep this open until we get you know, at least half of you guys out there responding to this. So, um, and you can see, we're just asking it, it looks good. Uh, it needs some work. And then we did have, you know, people last time that mentioned in the chat pod, um, you know, I haven't seen the NUG before. Um, I don't necessarily have an opinion and that's absolutely all right. Um, and the only other thing I would offer um, for some of those that are, our um, selecting needs work, which is great. Um, but if you have any suggestions, we'd love to see those in the chat pod as well. So just let this go just a little bit longer. Okay, Paul, Jim, Joe, we're up, to, we're up to 44. Do you want to keep going or do you want, are we good? Seems to me that there's a lot of lazy people up here. <laughs> we're only at 44 and there's, uh, there's 129 people on. So come on. Come don't on, be folks, hey. come on. At least get half. You know, we want this, we want this, uh, not the national goals. This is, our goal, right? It's not, it's not Paul, Jim and Joe's and Katie's nug. It's the nation's nug. So we want your input and, um, and that's important. And we want to be able to um, sort of um, say it was, it was a sort of a national effort. We're going to be running this, um, this by a, a few other groups, uh, our executive leadership group for one. So um, it, it's not the world according to us, but it's everybody. So um I want you to be a voting member here. So um, even there's a couple of more questions coming up. So if you hadn't had a chance to, um, you know, get on, let's get going. So, all right, we we'll get more more activity now. Fifty six or so. Okay. Just about a half. Just a couple yep. more. So one more, and we'll get there. Ah, oh, perfect. All right. <laughs> so thank you everybody for voting. 
Um, and alternatively, too, for those of you guys who have some suggestions, you know, send that to Paul, Jim, or Joe, um, and, and we'll be happy to take a look at those. So. Um, so the next piece that we wanted to spend, what we wanted to spend a little time talking about today are the objectives that support, um, or I'm sorry, the strategies that support the NUG. So this is kind of uh, the framework you can see. We have the three objectives at the top. Um, there's 12 core strategies, and then there's actually six cross-cutting uh, strategies. And I'm going to go through those really quickly, just so you guys have that background information. Um, but then we're going to focus on the cross cutting strategies uh, to get your opinion on today. So um, again, we have these six cross cutting strategies. Uh, they kind of focus on things like the programs and partnerships and training uh, and data and all those things that could be done at a high level that would support all three of the objectives of the NUG. And then there's objectives that are uh, specific. And again, these are the original. So they call back to the original objectives. So someone specific to safety, um, looking at recommended practice, move over slowdown laws, uh, making sure there's training and awareness out there um, specific to safety. Um, and then for objective two, we have ones on uh, multidisciplinary procedures, um, response and clearance time goals, um, availability of resources. So again, those are specific to that second objective. And then the last one is prompt, reliable, interoperable communication. Um, obviously, with the change we're making, this these strategies um, will probably see the biggest change. Um, but again, that will be at uh, either the September or October uh, talking to him that we get into these strategies. So like I said, what we really want to focus on today um, is the cross-cutting strategies. So um, we have, again, some um, participation that we're looking for you guys um, through Mentimeter. Um, about the ones in blue are really what we're going to focus on today. Um, and then we'll have kind of an open-ended uh, opportunity here. But so um, the first cross-cutting strategy, um, when we talk about all the time that's so critical to having a successful uh, traffic incident management is those partnerships and programs to support that. Um, and so if you go ahead and go back to the Mentimeter um, and just go, I just need to go to the next question. Second. So now we should be on to the next question. And again, it's the same Mentimeter, same code that we were on before, is we just want to look at some alternatives to that um, Tim, sorry, Tim partnerships and programs. So the first one is to just say, let's keep it the same, no change. We want to focus just on partnerships and programs. Um, the sec second option um, would be to update it to say Tim partnerships, programs, and coalitions. Um, We've really been using that word coalition to kind of, you know, um, cover everything, committees, uh, sometimes they're called task force, sometimes they're called Tim teams. Um, and we're trying to just use one word for that so we don't end up with a slash of six different things that they're called. Um, but again, it's just updating that um, to include specifically calling out how important it is to have those coalitions and those groups that are meeting together. Uh, on a regular basis. So, and again, we have another option here for you guys. Um, if you have a different suggestion or, or other things, we're very open to that. And we'd love to see that in the chat pod or, um, you know, you could always email that to us as well. So getting some good responses here. I see um, the addition of coalition seems to be favorable with some of you guys. We'll just leave this up here a little bit longer. Yeah, we went we went back and forth, right, Katie and Jim, Joe. We we talked about you know, you know the committee. The word committee is used, and the word um, uh, Tim Teams is used. Um, we just settled on coalition because we the, the think we believe that's more representative. Um, 
Um, but, you know, it, they're all interchangeable, and in, at least in my opinion, um, that, that, you know, committees, Tim teams, whatever you want to call yourself, a task force. I know we, in Massachusetts, we called ourselves a task force. So, um, you know, we, we just thought coalition might be the best representation since it's a coalition of the disciplines, uh, in, at least in theory. So. Sorry, Katie. No, no, that's great. Um... And we do have a question, you know, some questions in here um, that I'll just highlight. And I, I do think that for Kurt's comment is, you know, doesn't in a program include a coalition? And I, I would say that's a critical part of the program. Um, so I do think that with just the word programs, it's implied. Um, this just kind of calls it out more specifically. So, but yes, I would I would agree that a coalition is just a piece of your program. So I think we're just trying to highlight. Yeah, I, would, I would agree. I would agree. But we've had that confusion in the past, right? That people think people aren't clear that your committee is an important part of that of that overall program. And um, and in many respects, the committee is is representative of the program. So that's, we've had that issue in the past, so. Okay, well, thank you guys for voting. We just have a couple more we'll go through. Um, and so when we look, go back here to the strategies, the second strategy is multidisciplinary NIMS and TIM training. Um, and honestly, we didn't see a, a need to change that at this time, I think, um, it still is really important. Obviously the TIM training is a huge priority um, and we think that's, you know, remains to be critical. Um, for each one of these, there'll be a more uh, longer explanation of each. That piece of it probably needs to be updated and is out of date, um, but that high level pushing the training, um, again, we didn't see much need to change. Um, so we wanted to go on and look at the third strategy, um, which is goals for performance and progress, um, which we think is really critical. Um, but we also know there's a huge push um, and how do you measure that goals once you set a goal for performance and progress. Um, and so that's where we had added data collection analysis and reporting. So if we go on to this, um, sorry, onto the next question, really we're looking for, you know, uh, what do you guys think about the goals for, for performance and progress? Should we keep that? No change. Should we replace that with data collection analysis and reporting? Or should we add? Should we keep both? Should we keep that? You know, we need to have the goals and then we need to work with the data um, and have, you know, basically now we'd have seven cross-cutting strategies instead of six. I'm seeing a clear preference seems, here. <laughs> seems, to be, seems to be a trend for me. I, I see a trend with this one. <laughs> so, yeah, I'll, go, I'll let it go for another second or so, but um, I, I, I tend to agree there's a good need to call out, hey, let's set some goals. Let's make sure we have the data to, to measure that we're being successful. Let's make sure we have the data to share and let our partners know what we're doing. Um, you know, let's make sure we have the data to put together a good business uh, uh, business case for Tim. So, um, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna call that one. Thank you guys for participating there. Um, and then the last three, we have Tim Technology, obviously with EDC six and everything we're doing that continues to be important. Um, and there continues to be emerging and new technologies that we're looking at. Um, and then effective TIM policies, the training is great, but what does your you know, agency have in place to make sure that what you learn is followed? So I think there's always, and that really applies again to all three of the objectives. Um, and then there's a need for that awareness and education, um, both for fellow responders as well as for the public. So um, we really thought those three are, are pretty solid um, and that we wanted to maintain them. So, um, but we did want to offer up if you guys had anything else that you thought should be in this more of a cross-cutting, um, you know, that we should 
also think about and include. So this one is just a word, uh, you know, a word cloud. If anybody has any thoughts or ideas, um, I'm actually going to kind of push this off the screen so you guys can see what's there. Um, and then if you have thoughts of things that we need to add, you could go ahead and type that in into that word cloud option. So um, again, or, uh, you know, very, uh, we're happy to get it through email or in the chat pod as well. But I see, I see one entry. Yeah, and we'll just give a give a people um, or give people just a minute if, if they want to think about it. I know uh, free text is always a little bit harder than the other. And really, so that's, you know, we'll, I'm going to keep that open for a little bit and let people add to it. Um, seeing some things in there like uh, partnerships, stakeholders, champions, um, some keywords in there, making sure we're talking about incident response. I think Jack had mentioned that in the pod, uh, chat pod as well, that we're highlighting that piece of it. Um, so legislation. Yeah, so these are all good, good ideas. I appreciate you guys adding them in. Now, John Sullivan agreed with Jack Sullivan, uh, <laughs> his son Jack John cool. Sullivan. Uh, they're, not, they're not related, but he, but John Sullivan did agree with Jack. So, oh. yeah. So I'll share this just for a second. But so, um, thanks to everybody for participating. Um, again, like Paul said, we want this to be an inclusive activity and we need your guys' input. Um, so, so next time we'll probably look at the responder safety and um, safe quick clearance strategies. Um, and then we'll kind of bring it, you know, to a close by talking about what should the strategies be to um, support communication coordination and cooperation. So um, that'll kind of be the end of, you know, the series that we're going through. Uh, getting your guys' input. So, yeah, thanks. That was a, some, someone mentioned um, at outreach. So, that's a good one. Okay. Yeah. So, and again, we'll probably we'll share these responses again probably next month. So, you guys can see, you know, it came out of it. And then there'll you know, when the PowerPoints are shared, you'll have kind of a record of that as well. So. All right, thanks yeah. everybody. Thanks Katie, nice job. So Joe, there's a couple of questions in the chat. I think you may be uh, yeah. responding to one of them already. Yeah, I've been, I've been catching them as I can, Paul. Uh, okay. Some great suggestions in there, some questions they're there for a while they were coming in quicker than I could get to them, so. Oh, we got a few minutes if you wanna. Um, yeah. I, I, I think we can answer the first, the, the one I'm looking at with both the house alerts and ICOM. Well, yeah, that's the one that I had a question on, you know, <clears throat> or the, the original question was uh, the, uh, an automatic alert system to 911. Oh. And, oh, I see, okay. Uh, right, 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 vehicle crashes, sends alert. You know, like OnStar airbags deploy or something like that, it goes to an OnStar operator who then relays the information to the appropriate agencies. Uh, but I, I think the question was more like direct connect to a 911 center. And I, right off the bat, I can see the, the challenges involved with that. But, you know, the first thing that came to my mind were, you know, the Haas alerts and ICON and, you know, the, the, the things that are out there right now. And I'm not aware of anything that's, you know, directly linked to a 911 center. Uh, if you are, please share it with me, but am I on the right track there? Yeah, I think so, I think so. Yeah. Okay. TJ had a question, TJ, um, a friend from um, Nebraska. Um, and when is a new training being released? Um, 
Jody, I mean, Jim, you have a better answer than I'm going to give, which is sometime late fall. I don't know, Jim. Yeah, Paul, I've been telling everyone before the end of the year, okay. our challenge is, as usual, the long process is it, that is the public affairs review that we have to adhere to. So we, we've been saying fall, uh, and fingers crossed, maybe we can have it by, you know, uh, October-ish, October or so, but fingers crossed. Yeah, we're, we're pretty close to ready, right? I mean, we're, we're submitting them, right, Jim? You're submitting them? Okay, well. Yeah, Paul, but you know, <laughs> you know what yeah, I mean. Yeah, no, it's, what I'm saying is it's close from our end. Now it gets out of our hands and goes to public affairs. <laughs> right, mm -hmm. so if you think about the months and how quick Things are are moving. Get that question a lot, though. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Paul, can I can I pull back to another question there uh, earlier on? Sure. From TJ, from TJ and, and was talking about the self assessments and the question was some um, who approves the registration? Yeah, yeah, right? well, you did. Yeah, and then he followed that up right with you know, okay, so who gets approved and. Who, who has say in it, right? So I was wondering if we could address that because it seemed, to me, it caught my eye. Yeah, it's a good question. And, and I don't know that we've thought it through because it's the first time it's actually self-registration uh, in advance. So that's a good question, TJ. We'll, we'll bounce it around. But yeah, I think so. Um, just off the cuff here, thinking that, um, you know, if someone from Nebraska other than TJ is on there, then maybe we need to have a discussion. Um, you know, I, we, we know most of the, well, we know who has submitted them last year and then previous years. And we also know who the leads are in, in the States, right? So, you know, I would know enough to maybe, uh, if we had a question to reach out to somebody, you know, like in the Nebraska, TJ, reach out to you. Um, so we would, you know, I think that's what we would need to do. And for the self-assessment team, um, contractor team that's on, I think we need to, I keep an eye on that if we have multiple, it seems like multiple people for, uh, you know, certain locations, then we, we might want to just, uh, just check in on that. So, but, you know, the more the merrier, as far as we're concerned, if someone wants to lead a self-assessment in a, in an area, um, you know, that, that's, a, that's good, we think, but uh, maybe we're not, we're missing something, but, um, but that's a good point, TJ, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll keep an eye on that. There you go. Well, clock on the wall says 3 p.m. Paul, Jim, you have anything additional? You closing remarks or? I'll just say no. Nope, thanks. I would think it was a great talking, Tim. Uh, we had a lot. We loved it. We love that input. We love that Met Mentimeter front. We're always trying to find a way to become interactive, and a, a lot of you did. At least half of you did. So appreciate that, Jim. Yeah. Train, train, train. <laughs> come on everybody let's go get those numbers to us come on we know you've trained or you forgot to log them in either train somebody or give us give us the data bye got three Don't weeks forget paul's challenge yeah this is the challenge there you go national tim challenge yep there you go hey thanks all the all the uh the guests and uh thanks for our our, our speakers and to noco again uh, wish you all well. Please join us again in September and uh, stay safe. Look forward to talking to you. Thanks again. Thank you.